Well, let me just say, it's always a joy, always such a joy to be with you. And I think if you're visiting here, you probably already know the reason why we're here, <laughs> and that's to praise God and worship Him. And the psalm that we're going to look at today is going to give some highlights about that, more highlights about that, if you will. Um, and I pray that it adds something to our hearts in that regard of joy and praise and worship. The series on Psalms has been very encouraging for me. It's taken us through some questions, uh, uh, some times when people have struggled and so forth. But um, in the middle of it is what Pastor Eli preached last week, the unity that we have in this. Such, such an important thing. So first and foremost, knowing that God is always with us and we have him at the center of our life. Uh, and because of him, we are the body of Christ. And that encourages us greatly. But I like that little two-letter pronoun that Eli emphasized last week, we. And so that is in the message today, I hope, in, in a strong way. We are in this together. Um, now, some people would say, well, you know, this, this added thing, it's like icing on the cake or sweet icing on the cake. Or my brother Jason would say, it's like good gravy on the biscuit, you know. It's, it's something more that we have. I'm not saying that, that salvation, that initial thing isn't so important. It certainly is. It's ultimately the most important thing. But I'm thinking of these things that this psalm adds to that for us that we can. Uh, and I'll have to I have to tell you that I the purpose of this message too is I believe for me equipping me to be able to tell people of this, to be able to say this is why we praise God, this is why we worship Him. So Psalm 33 is. Uh, unnamed among 34 psalms, I think, of the 150. It's one of the unnamed ones. So I hope you won't think it wrong of me to give it this title, Why We Praise God. And God being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, too, I would say. So as we go through this psalm together, we're going to let it reinforce some of the key reasons we have for our joy as we praise God. Now, again, the main idea is putting forth statements, I hope we can all claim, that we can all uh, enjoy, but it's the thought behind it is when someone would ask you, why do you gather uh, once, twice, maybe three times a week just to praise God? You know, there's that kind of skeptical question out there. Or why are you in your backyard singing some religious sounding songs of praise, you know, when nobody else is around? Why, why are you doing that? Do you really have to? No, we get to. We get to. So um, these responses can always be on our minds, and we always should be ready to answer that to someone that would ask us that question, as in 1 Peter 3.15. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, Always be ready to explain it. Always be ready to give them some, some good responses to that. Now, before we step through the verses of Psalm 33, let me say a few words about Psalm 32. Psalm 32 ends the same way that Psalm 33 starts, with praise and worship. Um, rejoicing and having joy as we praise the Lord. Now, in Psalm 32, David praises the Lord primarily for the forgiveness of his sins, as we see in Psalm 32, 1, 1 through 2. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. I think I put a little disclaimer on the, uh, the last verse that is from the New Living Translation. So if you're wondering about what, you know, that's what I'm, I'm using today, the New Living Translation. Now, some have said that this thought in Psalm 32 may have actually come prophetically from David 
looking ahead to Isaiah 6, 61, 10. Because there's so much more than just the forgiveness of our sins in this salvation. Isaiah 61, 10. I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God. He has dressed me with the clothing of salvation, draped me in the robe um, of righteousness. Okay, so that's that's something that, that sometimes just overwhelms us. There is this incredible relationship with God at this point. We're not just forgiven sinners floating around in some unattached universe. <laughs> no, we have this relationship that really binds us together and binds us to the one that we worship and praise. So our first response when asked that question, why we praise God, can be the same praise as David's. Number one, we praise God for the death and resurrection of Jesus to forgive our sins and give us the free gift of eternal life. Now, as we look at Psalm 33, we can respond that God is to be praised because he is that salvation in our lives and also so much more. So before we start answering more why questions, let's take a look at the first three verses of Psalm 33. Let the Lord God sing for joy to the Lord. Let the godly sing for joy to the Lord. It is fitting for the pure to praise him. Praise the Lord with melodies of the lyre. Make music for him on the ten-string harp. Sing a new song of praise to him. Play skillfully on the harp and sing with joy. So this is about our, our praise. And I think sometimes the meaning of praise and worship get a little bit too separated. For me, the simple answer to that is we praise God for, as we've already sung, how worthy he is above all. And that both of that can be done with song. It actually can be done silently also or, and with a prayer that we have our praise and worship for him. Praise is like, like worship is more of a response than a, just an activity. You know, we sometimes say, well, are you praising? Well, yes, it's from a response. It's not from some acted out thing, you know, that we have no uh, feelings about. Um, and we do that, again, as we acknowledge uh, all the wonderful righteous deeds of God. He is worthy of praise. Note how close the definition of worship is to praise. Worship is when we give our deepest affections our highest praise to something. True worship is when we praise God above everything else and we put him first in our hearts. For some congregations, they use the idea of worship to be mainly about music and singing. That's just one aspect of worship, and yes, it is a good one. It's one that we, we uh, are fully embracing. But we also worship God as we gather by listening and expecting God to speak to us, no matter who has prepared a message that comes from his revealed word. So I hope today we come expecting, regardless of who's up here, to hear from God and from his word. Thanking God for our hearts with prayer is also worship. The offering that we bring in is also worship, also part of worship. So verse one starts with the instruction to sing for joy because it's fitting. Some translations say it's comely. As I looked up the, the word in Hebrew, it can mean in Greek beautiful, which I think is the best for me to think of. My praise is beautiful. My worship is beautiful to the Lord. Now, verse 2 and 3 talk about certain musical instruments from the time and with a song of joy. I would bet you, if we had a harp, Josiah's, oh yeah, he's out there. I bet you Josiah could play that if we had a 10 string. <laughs> I don't know. He's amazing to me and so forth. But um, I'm not sure who's going to be on the lyre. Uh, here, but anyway, the idea behind it is the worship and the praise that comes from our heart. Um, and again, it can be in silence. Sometimes I'm not speaking it out, but I'm feeling it in my heart, even as we're going through the music. Now, this concept of a new song goes along with the rest of the song. 
It means we are to be thoughtful and we are to exercise our minds to realize new reasons to praise him. It should be clear that we have many reasons every day to praise God for his grace, his blessings, his goodness. Jeremiah, even in his Lamentations, wrote in Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh every morning. Now, when some of you musically gifted people come up with a new song, it may sound beautiful to others. On the other hand, a new song from someone like me may cause people to say, what was that? <laughs> that didn't sound too much like a song. But again, God looks at our heart for that. And to him, my new song, your new song, your new song is beautiful to God from the heart. Well, let's think about Psalm 33, 4 through 5. And let's get into these reasons uh, as we start in, in Psalm 33, 4 and 5. It says, for, which is a word to reason, for the word of the Lord holds true, and we can trust everything he does. He loves whatever is just and good. The unfailing love of the Lord fills the earth. So that brings us to number two. Um, this indicates a reason, uh, our gift of salvation, the eternal life, uh, and we can tell people other reasons. Number two, we can praise God for his word of truth and love perfectly combined. We can rejoice in God's word and praise him for it. Now, some may try to sell you this idea, okay, the Old Testament is all about judgment and the New Testament is all about love. Now, don't let, don't let anybody try to sell you that idea. A much repeated verse by me is from Jeremiah 9, 24b. God is talking to mankind, and if they want to consider something special in their life, consider this, that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love who brings justice and righteousness to the earth, and that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. So I think that pretty much tells it what he wants us to know about him. Now, of course, there's many, many other places, things that we can come to know. I think God, in a way, is saying, if you really know me, you will know this, that I am a, a God of love and, and judgment. Um, he is a never-changing God. Malachi uh, 3 says, I am the Lord, I change not. So it's not like, well, in the Old Testament I was this, but in the New Testament I've, I kind of changed my, my attitude toward that. No, that's, that's not going to happen. Isn't it amazing that God tells us through his word what he, we need to know about him? As you go through life uh, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit indwelling you, we get to know him more and more. In this psalm, it may seem like he's only speaking about the word of written scripture or scripture, but it's also about the living word, which we know from Genesis through Revelation is Jesus Christ, the living word. Now, the real word of God is like a compass that leads us, his people through the wilderness, like this part of Exodus where they were led out of slavery um, at that time. Ironically, the world is in slavery to sin, but yet many won't look to God for freeing them from that. Okay? It doesn't make sense to us because God has already put our Holy, his Holy Spirit in us. So we have spiritual eyes that we didn't have before uh, we could see that. And again, that's why I want us to be able to try to talk with people and explain to them the reasons behind our praise and worship. So around us, we see the results of abandoning the word of God, to treat it as some fairy tale. The obvious results of man's decision to abandon God's word is increasing evil and chaos in society. Now, on the other hand, we can discern his will for the cause of our lives, and we can find out how we are to live day by day. Day. 
That's such a great reason to praise him. We're not just wandering around here without any uh, guidance or out any direction. Uh, we praise him because he has revealed himself, and he does. His Holy Spirit, through his Holy Spirit, lead us in this world. In addition, God's word is not just instruction. It's truth. It's very personal. It's filled with his love. As we see in the gospel with Jesus, uh, in this case, God showed his perfect combination of judge, judgment or justice and love by sending his son as a sacrifice for sin on the cross. This was such a great mystery. We could never figure this out without his special, specific revelation. His written word handed down through the ancient past and his living word shown to the world at his first coming. How else could such a holy, transcendent, eternal God reveal himself to man? Look at what a blessing it is to have his word, his revealed word. And don't let anybody tell you that, no, somebody took that away. You know, that doesn't, uh, that uh, we need to search for it again. No, it's there. He wants us to, he wants us to see it. God's written word and living word are such a wonderful reason for our joy and why we praise God. And if that's not enough, okay, we're just kind of building up steam here. Let's look at Psalm 33, 6 through 9. And this we respond to, to the world too. The Lord spoke, merely spoke, and heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. He assigned the sea its boundaries and locked the oceans in vast reservoirs. Let the whole world fear the Lord and let everyone stand in awe of him. For when he spoke, the world began. It appeared at his command. So number three, we praise God for his creative power to speak the universe into existence. Now, in these verses, the psalmist reminds us that everything we see around us, as well as the unseen world, was spoken into existence. I love the opening words of the hymn, How Great Thou Art. I don't know. Maybe we could do this a cappella, <laughs> you think? All right, let's, let's look at this. I won't sing too much because I might. Okay, but you sound out. Oh, Lord, my God, when I am awesome wonder, consider all the world's sins must be. I see the stars, I hear the to sing the rest, but let's, we'll stop there. We'll have other songs to sing today, too. So this creation wasn't just out there. Uh, it wasn't pre-existing matter. There weren't eternal angels, sun, moon, stars. They were all made by the Word of God. The essential Word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, as is mentioned in John 1, 4. The, wor the Word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. So the scripture's pretty plain. He has revealed these things uh, to us in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now we're also told that uh, all creation was made by the breath of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. We shouldn't think of one person took this part and another person took that, uh, but as Eli previously reminded us from this pulpit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit jointly concerned in creation. Okay, We can't eliminate one and say, well, he wasn't part of that. Um, 
Now, somebody might say, well, that's okay. That's good information about power, creative glory, and so forth. But it's not just information. It's more about relationship. Remember, we were created to be in the image, not images, of the one triune God. So just think for a minute. Think of someone that is so amazed that they got to meet, maybe even know the person who just invented the, the PC or the Internet, something like that. Even a person can be amazed to know the two men, Watson and Crick, that discovered the DNA molecule structure that's central to biological life. How amazing it how amazing and when I tell them, I actually know the one that created that structure and everything ever connected to it. Even more, he actually knows me in a personal way. Now that is amazing. That is something that uh, we can share with people that um, he is the creation of all. The ideal of that not only causes me to fear God in the right way as an awesome creator, but gives me the the joy and the reason to praise God. Personally, I, for me, that's, that's really important. That's a, one of my responses of why I praise him. Some people say, well, science takes you away. No, no, science, it, it, it brings me back to God. God created science, too. <laughs> so however we flail around, you might say. Okay, there's more. We're just... We'll just get going. Let's think about Psalm 33, 10 through 12. The Lord frustrates the plans of the nations and thwarts all their schemes. But the Lord plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. What joy for the nation whose God is the Lord, whose people he has chosen as his inheritance. So that brings me to reason number four. We praise God for his sovereign and perfect will and choosing us for his inheritance. Now men can make schemes and plans and they can devise all they want, but in the end, God's will is going to be accomplished. I think we, we reckon that and know that. We look at the maneuvering of nations and possibly become filled with fear sometimes. The foolish decisions by many governments can leave us wondering how things will play out in time and history. But we need not fear. Our God is in control of all things. It doesn't really matter how things look. God will have the final word. His will is dominant. The concept bothers some people because they think, but if we just make the right decisions, then this can happen. You know, uh, well, we have to do this our part. Uh, let me tell you, that's something known as open theology. <laughs> the idea that maybe God doesn't know until we act, that's heresy. Yeah, don't let anybody ever tell you that. Did God know? Yes, he knew. He knows. As we praise God for his sovereign will, and we can include praise for giving us purpose in life, that purpose is not to change God's mind, uh, as we talked about yesterday in men's study, uh, it is to walk with God in all circumstances, to listen and to let him guide us uh, through life. Um, now, many therapists have said there's no heavier burden on people's life than to feel purposeless, to have no purpose in life. But we, don't, we can't say that. We know that God has a purpose for it. And... I know Jason, one of Jason's favorite uh, uh, scripture verses there in Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything to work out together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And the purpose is for my good and his glory. That's, that's what's going to be. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not one who thinks... You know, I shouldn't vote or I shouldn't get involved where I live today. But I do think events of the day should not push us to despair or cause us to act hateful 
to people that we disagree with? No, there's no place for that in God's word and as God, Holy Spirit leads us. So earth, verse 12 is important to me. I'll let you know, I love America. And I think anyone should feel about and care about their nation in the world, wherever you come from. Now, that doesn't mean I put my nation ahead of other nations when it comes to the love of God. No, I should pray for all the nations of the world. I pray that all come to know the love of God. But, you know, at the end of the day, my true nation is the one that Jesus claims as his people. That is the only true nation whose God is the Lord and the only one he will have as his inheritance. So knowing and living by the will of God, it's a good pattern. While rejecting his will and going through against his plan is a recipe for spiritual disaster. We can see that playing out in many nations of the world. But the new nation we belong to is God's people will never fall. Let's take joy in that and give that as a reason why we praise God. We are part of a new nation, the one that will never fall. I've heard this next one before here several times in the body, and you know who you are who have come out with this. It's what we see in Psalm 33, 13 through 18. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees the whole human race. From his throne, he observes all who live on the earth. He made their hearts so he understands everything they do. The best equipped army cannot save a king nor is a great strength enough to save a warrior. Don't count on your war horse to give you victory. For all its strength, it cannot save you. But the Lord watches over those who fill him, those who rely on his unfailing love. So number five that I've had is that we praise God for his watchful eye over us, no matter where we are. There's an old hymn actually written in 1905 sung by a woman at Billy Graham's Evangelism Crusades. Uh, the African-American woman, Ethel Waters, that sang that was born out of a situation where her 12-year-old mother was raped by an older man. Now that song was written in 1905 reflecting on the words of Jesus in Matthew 10, 29 through 31. What is the price of two sparrows, one copper coin? But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Um, so we do. We praise God for his watchful eye over us. Now, although the song was written when uh, I think Ethel Waters was only nine years old, it became a very new and a very personal new song for her all through her adult life. And she sang it. I mean, I heard her a number of times when I was watching some of the Crusades sing that. She sang it with real passion, with real praise on that, too. So, and it kind of draws me back to uh, Psalm 139. Uh, verses 1 and 16 through 17. Psalm 139, 1. O Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. And then verses 16 through 17. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. Psalm 33, 13 actually talks about the whole human race. God sees the whole human race. Nothing gets past him. But then when you jump down to verse 18, it says he watches over those who fear him and trust him for his unfading love. Now, you probably know that many rich and famous people have many security guards. Okay, they have 
lots of people protecting them and so forth. Some of them in verse 14 through 17 of that uh, Psalm 33, it says, even may have a whole army guarding them, but no one army can really save you from danger. We have the biggest and the most powerful bodyguard in the universe that's watching over us. That's our security, and that's God. God watches over those who trust in him, and he's not part of the secret service. There's no secret. We want everybody to know that that he is that God that watches over us every day. And that's another good reason to praise him. Let me conclude this message with Psalm 33, 19 through 22. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in times of famine. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. So that brings me to, to number six uh, and the last point. We praise God for he, how he rescues us with his unfailing love. Of course, this is first going to come back to uh, where we started in Psalm 32. Because of his death on the cross and resurrection, we're truly rescued, not from bodily death, but from spiritual death, eternal death. Additionally, I've heard some testify here uh, how they've been rescued from things here in their physical life, but most importantly, that he has conquered eternal death for us. And we're reminded of this in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thank God... Uh, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. God just told us through his, this psalm that his destinies of the nations are in his hand. The decisions that will determine the course of the world, they're not made in Washington or Moscow or Beijing. They're made by God in his perfect and just will. The decisions that will affect the course of the world are made in heaven by our sovereign God. The amazing thing is while God sovereignly controls everything that takes place in the universe, he still has time for us as the individual, me personally on that. Of course, we don't have to memorize these poetic words of Psalm 33, but it wouldn't hurt for us to do that. The important thing is whatever words we use, they need to be from a grateful heart of praise as we share people. So as we share God's word, as we share the gospel with people, that needs to come from a loving heart of praise in God and love for the person that we're sharing it with. I hope that that reminds me and it equips me to be more about how I share with people that have not yet put their faith and their trust in God. Someone asked the saints here today, and we may give these reasons. Uh, they're not an exhaustive list, and again, we don't have to say them, you know, exactly in this way, but hopefully we all need to have a grateful heart of praise. Let me go through these six responses again just as we can look at them. Now, I know you're not a rowdy bunch, <laughs> but I do know you can say amen to certain things. All right? Amen. There it is. So let's start with number one. We praise God for the death and resurrection of Jesus to forgive our sins and give us the free gift of eternal life. Amen. We praise God for his word of truth and love that is perfectly combined. We praise God for his creative power to speak the universe into existence. Amen. We praise God for his sovereign and perfect will and choosing us for his inheritance. Amen. Hallelujah, too. <laughs> we praise God for his watchful eye over us. Amen. We praise God for how he rescues us with his unfailing love. 
Now, at the end of this psalm, our hearts should take a fresh look every day at God and how we might be filled with praise for him, rejoicing for the whole world to see, to share that with others. Our rejoicing, our praise is not just for us. It's for the world to see his glory. Okay, Not our glory, not we're such good people that we praise, uh, but we have hearts overflowing with that. So however you want to explain that to people, you can use some of Psalm 33 or other psalms, but share it. Share it with people around you. Let's close in prayer. Let me add one more verse. Hebrews 13, 5b. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Okay, remember that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, well, so much. We praise you for who you are. We worship you. But help us to have hearts that are ever praising, ever worshiping, uh, not only when we gather here, but through the days, each day. And help us to be very willing and able to share that with others, to explain to them why we praise you, why we worship you. So many good reasons, and we just thank you that you have shown us who you are and, and you've reached out to us with your unfailing love. And we give you thanks, and we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.